Right. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> the, the, the change here is be, especially you listen to me, the change here will be subject to this and the state equations 9.45 and 0.6 and the constraint 9.43, okay? These two are state equations, these are, this is a constraint, okay? So that would be a change. Okay. I have to see whether also it's in the book. So we'll talk about that later. So we have a control problem. And let's see, we go this one and then we have. So now is in a chapter eight, we have four state equation and we will put four adjoint variables. And remember in, in, in my form of the problem, you, there is no objective function with an integral, and here there is no objective function with the, with the summation like this. So for this, uh, Hamiltonian only consists of the four state equation and the adjoint variable. Nothing comes from the objective function because the objective function has no integral. So lambda one time, the first state equation, lambda two, the second equation, then the third equation, the fourth state equation. That's our Hamiltonian. To maximize the Hamiltonian, the first they get the adjoint equation. So the adjoint equation is lambda one k plus one minus lambda one k, which is delta lambda one k, is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the first state variable. And this is the condition lambda one t one comes from the derivative of the first derivative of the, 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 the objective function with respect to A, which is this one, so it becomes one. This becomes minus one because this is derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to B. Huh? What's going on here? What is going on here? That's correct. No, no, lambda one t. No, I'm sorry, I, it is correct. Lambda one t is the derivative of the 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 not the Hamiltonian derivative of the objective function with respect to a, and that gives you one, and b one gives you minus one because there's a minus one here. And then there is a there's another one that's a fourth equation. Third equation is with respect to r, and there is no r term into the objective function, so this is zero. And the fourth term, the the uh, the, the, the with respect to x k, and the, the objective function has this 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 one minus r, one minus one plus one, no one plus rho to the minus t. This remember this is a constant for this problem. So we have this one, and this is a one, one, one plus rho to the minus t, so we have this. With these objective, with these conditions, there is nothing involved, there's no x, there's no u, so they can be solved completely independently, so I have the solution. Here's the solution of all the lambdas. This is straightforward because this is zero and this is one, so it's one all the way. This is zero, this is minus one all the way. And, and this one is a minus lambda one, so this will become this sigma here, which is very easy because you just take term by term, it's starting from here, you get the summation, and here is lambda four t equals zero, so you have just this. Because this is also zero, so it is basically this. So we have four values of lambda, uh, all of this is done. And then we can find the control. So H can be written as some function which is independent of U and function that depends on U. And that part is given by this. Notice that this is not depending on U. So the maximum principle, no, 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 this is H2UK, independent of UK and uh, H1 is a part of H, which is independent of UK, and H2 UK is given by this. And
you take the derivative of this function with respect to u sub k, you'll get some term from here. This, you will get some term from this, because this is a function of u sub k, that's a function of u sub k, so you will get some derivative with respect to that. So I take the derivative and I get this, and this should be equal to zero. What I'm going to do now, clearly you, you given some concave function, we can maximize these. It not, I remember I assumed this to be concave, so it's not a problem, but that is not my purpose. So I'm going to simplify this. My purpose here was to change the Thompson model into a chain of machines replace one after the other. That is the, that is the main purpose of this problem. So far we are, we are not there yet, but given that that's the purpose, it is not important for us to, 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 to worry about this business, so I can simplify it. Okay. So because of concavity, you can use sub K, but I'm gonna simplify uh, later when I do the numerical example. So, while we are have the optimal solution here, we can call the optimal solution to be to be this. You remember, it will depend on s, it will depend on t, and it will depend on k. So there is a function that will be depending on s, t, and a k. I can write that. So that is my optimal control. But notice that optimal control depends on the boundaries. So if the boundary, if this function is strictly between zero and us us sub k, or between zero and us sub k, which is the upper bound on 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 the control for that machine, machine s, bar in machine s and period k, then that is my control. If this function is less than zero, then my control is zero, and if this function is bigger than us k, then my control is us k. So this is a sad function in discrete time. Okay, it is almost the same now as we have this function. I go back to the picture here. That's a set function here. So if it's if it's above that, it's an upper bound. If it's below that, it's zero, and then in between it is u s k t whatever that function that we defined. So we have this kind of control, which is okay. Okay. Now I'm going to simplify the problem because I'm actually going to solve this problem numerically. So I'm going to define that function to be linear and that function to be linear. And then my Hamiltonian will be bang bang solution because that function now, the Hamiltonian will now have, an, have a switching function times u sub k. And the switching function is given by this. And my bang bang control will be u k star is bang between zero and u s k when w s k t. If this is bigger than zero, I use USK. If it's less than zero, I use zero. And if it's zero, then it's a singular control. We will not have a possibility of singular control here. It can be easily shown, maybe. Because that you have to maintain over time. Most of the time, that is not the case, unless you have a problem like in chapter seven. So we have, so this is where I am at. And I think that year, uh, Professor Thomas Morton, who was uh, quite a well-known guy in inventory control, did a PhD at University of Chicago and became an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon. And he was just going around saying hello to people. He comes to my desk and he said, what are you doing? He was not my advisor or anything. I said, I'm doing this. And I don't know the next step because I have to do the next step. It looks at this problem. 
And within a minute, he said, that's Wagner Witten. Now, Wagner Witten is a paper published in Management Science. And it was an inventory control paper, but I had not taken an inventory control and dynamic programming course as of yet. So I had no idea what Wagner Witten was at the time. So I look at the paper and lo and behold, it is Wagner Witten. I mean, in one minute, the guy said it's Wagner Witten. So I suppose he knew what he was trying. And I applied the Wagner Witten and I finished the paper. So I show you what is next, which is Wagner Witten. Um, It's a, it's a, it's a, it's called dynamic lot size model. Wagner written is a dynamic lot size model. It says there's a fixed cost of inventory, and you want to meet the demand, and and so what you do is you 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 produce so much, and then you deplete it, and you produce so much, and the demand is changing over time. So remember, if it's a fixed demand, and a fixed fixed cost then it is called economic lot size problem. You go like a triangle, and then next is another identical triangle, and it's identical. But if the demand is time dependent, then it is called dynamic lot size model, not economic lot size model, but dynamic lot size model. Then it can go like this, then the second triangle can be like that, the third triangle can be like this. So different triangles depending on the demand. But notice my problem, the, the, the psi S, K, and phi S, T depends on S and T, depend on K, depend on K. And so because they depend on K, my forecast of technology is time dependent. And because it's time dependent, and I must pay a fixed cost of machine CS at each time when I buy a new machine, you can now see that this is like a dynamic lot size problem. Okay, so here's how you go. Suppose UK star has been obtained by solving my subproblem. Now, Tom Morton does not know optimal control theory. Okay, so I am doing my optimal control theory after taking the control theory course, and so I, I, I was sitting there with this one. I remember this conversation like it happened yesterday. And then we have, we can find out the optimal path for this SK problem, call it a sub problem. And I can do a complete solution, right? If I can do a complete solution, I can find the objective function. So I now know what is the objective function value of this first triangle, if you think about it in a dynamic large size setting, okay? And I call this can be done for each pair of machine purchase time S and sale times T bigger than S. So let GS denote the present value of the profit discounted from zero, discounted to zero of an optimal replacement schedule from S all the way to t minus one. Now it's almost similar also to the the, the, the not quite similar, but to, to similar to traveling salesman problem. So what I'm trying to do is here's the total time period. Okay, here's the total prime period zero to capital T minus the, the T periods, zero period, one period, T minus one period. And here is my S. And I'm saying that if I were to solve the problem from S to T, not from zero to T, from S to T, then the optimal value of this will be G of S, which is reasonable, because it only depends on S. So I can do that, G S. Then suppose I replace the first machine at T. So here's my S to T problem. First machine in S, so I go S to T, and from this point it is GT. 
So from this point T to capital T is going to be GT by definition, GS and GT, right? So GS now will be this value, which is GST, which I already solved as my control problem. And then from T to capital T, I define that to be GT. By the way, are you understanding my hands now or do I have to draw this picture? Anyone? Yes or no? That means, yes, you understand it. So GS, then if I, if I replace the, the first machine, that machine at S that I bought at S, I replace it time T, then I already know the value of that is GST star. So that step brings me from S to T. And then at T, I already know, because of my definite GS, optimal solution from T to capital T is G of T. What is the difference now? I know that if I go from S to T, and from T to T, that if that T was optimal, if that first step was optimal, then this, this sum will be GS. But the first step, that step may not be optimal. But the optimal could be not S to T, but it could be S to S plus one, S to S plus two, S to S plus three, S to T. So optimal could be a step going like this. So GS then has to be max of this sum where T goes from S plus one to capital T. Oh, this is a mistake too. No, 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 no. This is from zero to S going to T minus one. S is going to T minus one, but T must go to only capital T minus one or T. Let me see, where should the T go? Um, uh, T, no, S goes from zero to T minus one. And T, or T, T, T goes from, T goes from S plus one to T. Yes. Because here's from S to T. That machine can go from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. It can go from anywhere to anywhere, okay? So we have that. And the boundary condition of this equation is GT equal to zero. Yeah, okay. So this says JS S plus one to JS plus JS plus one, JS S plus two to JS plus two, JS S plus three to just thing goes all the way. To. And if I'm at T already, which is which is the end of the T minus one interval, then GT equal to zero. So now I can solve this backward. I start with GT equal to zero, then I can solve the problem for T minus one, keep capital T minus one, and keep going until I get to G zero. When I get to G zero, I have an optimal solution. So I'm gonna demonstrate that to you numerically. So I, 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 I demonstrate numerically, I go to, I got time enough. So for this, I just dream up some, numbers and some functions to give you a numerical solution. So first thing, and I can I can dream as a table, I can dream as a function, and I'm trying to be clever by half to some extent to give you sort of different flavor of how the data can be presented to this problem. So I'm presenting the data in a different form, okay? So, so first of all, I'm gonna take capital T to be three. Okay, so we have three periods, and zero, one, two are the 
the, the, the times at which I can buy the machine. Because the three is the end, so I can buy the machine at the beginning of zero, beginning of one, beginning of two, and then the, two, the second period, the, the third period, which is this one. So I assume C has to be this. That means machine price is increasing like this. I can just do a table, three numbers, right? It's only three numbers, C0, C1, C2, but I'm doing this way, just, just the heck of it. This kind of rate is 6%. Out of shop depreciation is 25%. And the maximum bound for the control is $100. And I'm going to assume for fixed for S and for fixed for every machine. Okay. It doesn't depend on S, doesn't depend on T, just to make my life simple, it's $100. I also have to define functions psi and phi. Okay. So here's how I'm going to do that. Let RSS be the net return of a machine purchase the beginning of period S and operated during that period. That means the first period of the purchase. I need that's the data. So I have to give that data. So R00 is 600, R11 is 1000, R22 is 1100. That's given to me. Then I have a dynamics because I have these initial conditions kind of this thing, then I have a dynamics. Dynamics is given by this, and now I'm going to use Thompson. So Thompson says the value of the machine goes down by, by some fixed period, and then it goes up by some kind of maintenance. So I have to supply you DS and AS. Those are the data. So D I'm going to supply as a table. So table of D is D0 200, 200, D150, D2 200. And AS I'm going to supply as a function. 0.5 plus 0.1 S cube. And just, just fun out of it. You know, I can just give you the numbers too. Okay, so we already talked about that. The excess K, the salvage value of time K of the machine purchase time S. So XSS is exactly one minus delta times CS. Delta is 0.25, so this is 0.75. So I have a XSS, which is the initial value, is given by that. And now I need the dynamics. So dynamics is, I'm going to say like this. So the cell, the, 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 the cell value of the machine, the cell value of the machine is, is, is increases by this and it decreases by this in each period. Okay, so I'm now going to give you another way of this data. I'm going to give you LS to be 0.1 when S is 0, 1, and it's 0.2 when S equal to 2, and a BS I'm going to give you as this function. So I give you data in different ways, but they are all equivalent, whichever way you want to give it, it doesn't matter. So I have the data, I have the dynamics, I now solve the problem. So given the data, let J star T be the optimal value of the objective function, machine purchase S and sold at T. We will now show, solve the problem for G. We, not, we need to solve this. J S T star for S equal to 0, 1, 2, and for S less than T, less than equal to 3, where T is an integer. So solving the problem, I find the, the switching value function, this one. I know AS, I know BS, and I know so I know this function. And we keep going. Uh, this is another way to, to, to just characterize that this function, in fact, if you take the difference of this function, it goes like this. And the sign of that difference is the sign of this, which means that the control will increase over time. If this is bigger than zero, it will decrease over time. It is less than zero. If it's equal to zero, it will stay zero. In my example, rho minus AS is less than zero, which means that if there's a switching in the preventive maintenance trajectory, the switch must be from 100 to zero. So remember now, we have a linear problem. We have a bank bank control. So the machine control is going to go down. So machine control can be 100 for a while and then zero. OK, or it could be all zero or it could be all 100. OK. So this is exactly the characteristic of the solution as in the original Thompson model. Okay. 
Now, remember, the purpose of this exercise is to demonstrate that I can do a replacement of machine over time and also use the optimal control and, and give you a solution where maintenance and replacement are both optimized. This has never been done before. Okay, this was the first time this control problem of this kind was ever solved. So now I'm solving the subproblems. So the first problem is buy the machine in period zero and sell it in period one. W001 is given to be less than zero, so the control for this machine is do nothing. Let's go to, so given that, given that we have R00, so given, the, given this control, I have to find out this 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 optimal objective function j01 star well the j01 star r00 is given r01 is given x00 is given x01 is given and i have the i know what the definition of j01 star is so j01 star gives us 213 dollars and 20 cents please please go over home and and look at all of these numbers and see how it's all done together but it's all straightforward so i can by solving this problem, because I know how to solve a control problem of Thompson type, I can find the objective function value. So this will give me J01 star. If I do similar things, S0 t equal to two, I look at the switching function, I find that the, the value again is zero, zero, and I can compute this value, this one. If I go from zero to three, I see the following. I see these are like this. And so the control for the first two period is 100, 100, and the last period is zero. And the value of the enterprise here is 639. Now I take S equal to one, T equal to two. I find control is zero. This is now maximum principle, discrete time, and we're solving it one by one. Okay, now S1 T equal to three, 100 and zero. This one is J13 star. S equal to two, three, this one, and got, I got all, all. Now we have a S1, S equal to one, S equal to two, T equal to three. And that's all. You can, that's all you can do because this is the last period. I saw that the beginning of this period and the T equal to three is exactly the end of that period. So this is the, this is, so we solve all the ST problems. Now the Wagner Whitney, which is a special case of dynamic programming. It's a simpler version of dynamic programming, particularly for the large size problem and, 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 and this problem. Well, G3 is zero, we know that. This was our beginning of the equation here. We has defined this. Now what we're doing, now what we're doing is this. Oh, I don't know, where is this? Where is this right there? But what we're doing now is solving this. We all have, we have JST star for every S and T, and now we are trying to find out GS, okay? Starting with GT equal to zero. So we start GT equal to zero, we have all of these, and we write, we, we solve this, this wagner witten equation this way, so we just solve that. Let's, let's go there. G3, zero. G2 is just J2, three star. There's no option. So it's $80. G1, I got two options. I can buy the machine at the beginning of period one and sell it at the very end. And I can buy the beginning of the machine at one, sell it at one period later, which is exactly uh, at the end of that period. And then from there, I have a G2, right? Because once I, have a, once I arrive at two, I, I already know the value of G2. So I have this and this, I take, I can compute this one. I already know this one. This one I know, I know G280, so I can put J12 star plus G2, which is this one. And then I sum those, this guy here, and then I can find out which is max. The max is this one, so I put, so I have a G1. Once I have a G1, I can go to G0. What is G0? I buy the machine at the beginning of zero, 
and, and, and keep it all the way. So this is one. I buy the machine at the beginning zero and keep it one period. When I keep it one period, then I have Z0 one start plus G1. Or I can buy the machine and sell it at the end of and the end of the, the, the second period, and then I have a G2. So then I can take these three guys. I can take the max of these, and the max of these is 1, 2, 3, 7.4. Okay. This 1, 2, 3, 7.4 comes from this middle. Okay. So I'm now going backward to construct the solution. Okay, so I, this G0 was obtained this way, and that one came from this T02, so that came from this 10,002, and, and, and so let's go like this. So now we can summarize the optimal solution. The optimal number of machine is two. The optimal purchase time and maintenance is as follows. The first machine, I purchased S equal to zero and sell at T equal to one. Okay, so that means two periods later period zero and period one, okay? So I sell at t equal to one, and then the maintenance is, no, just a second. I sell at t equal to one, and so s equal to zero, sell at t equal to one, I have maintenance policies, users not equal to zero. Okay, so this is first machine, oh no, I'm going, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. When I go this way, I'm go here, then I go there, I go backwards, so, so, so let's go backwards. Second machine policy is S equal to one, sell at equal to three, and it's 100 and zero. So what I'm trying to do is the following, sorry. I, this is where the optimal is coming from. That optimal is coming from 1024, which is this one. That one is coming from that guy, right? And that guy, we already know the solution, and the solution is this one. Purchase S equal to one, sell at equal to three, maintenance policy is 100 and then zero, and the objective value function for that is this, the, for that was 1024 or whatever. Once I'm, I'm there at, once I'm there, I have to figure out what happens, because this was purchased one, I still have a period zero. So I go to the first machine, you purchase zero and sell at one, and, and uh, the optimum control is a zero, and together of these, the cost is 1237.4. So I actually have an optimal policy by using the wagner widget. So this is a simple exercise for three period, but you can see the idea is easily can be done for any number of periods you want. You need the data. And when I had this, <coughs> I went to Tom and I said, problem is solved. And he said, you know, I mean, this is a very nice problem. I don't know why we went to um, Naval Research Logistics at the time, because we, at that time there was no UTD 24 and all this. You published the paper, when you thought where it wants to go, and it was not like management science was any better than NRL. I published paper in all kinds of journals at that time. And so I told uh, Tom that uh, the problem is solved. He said, well, we need to figure out how to do the authors. Uh, since uh, you solved the problem and I supplied you a critical part of the problem, which is Wagner Witten, um, and so what we do is we're going to throw a coin. So we, we do a coin toss, and in that coin toss, I win. This is the only coin toss I won in my life. I never won any lottery ever. And so because I won the coin toss, the paper is Sethi and Morton instead of Morton and Sethi, uh, because we could not figure out, uh, well, we did not figure out or try to figure out whether it should be alphabetical or against alphabetical or this or that. Uh, this is the way we resolve the problem. So you see this paper is Sethi Morton, 1972. Um, that's, that's about it. Uh, if there are questions, uh, we can now go with those questions. Any questions? No more questions? Then uh, we have a couple of minutes. So Kusali, can you uh, bring me chapter 10, please? Yes, Professor. Here you go. 
I just introduced you chapter 10. Uh, you may have read already chapter 10. Can you uh, bring me the, the next slide? Okay. So chapter 10, we have two problems. One of them is, both of them are uh, 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 renewable sources. And the last model that I'm not going to cover, which is 10.3, is exhaustible resource model. So natural resources are important. And the fishery resource model is you, are, you have a, 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 a lake or whatever, and you can fish. And if you fish too much, then there's no fish left. And if you fish too little, then you have less revenue in each period of time. And the question is, what is the optimal fishing rate? OK, so this is a problem that I saw. And it turns out that this problem, I did not solve it. I'm just saying this problem I covered. Uh, this problem was um, solved by someone in British Columbia who is a research economist. I knew him. And he had read my Vidalia Wolf paper in operations research, where I, for the first time, <clears throat> used Green's theorem um, to solve an optimal control problem. Once again, Green's theorem is, in that context, is not my main contribution. It was done by Angelo Mealy many, many years ago, but he didn't solve any particular problem using that, but he had mentioned it somewhere. And so I was probably the first one to use that. And that became quite popular and a number of people then used my Green's theorem technique to solve other problems. And Colin Clark, who at British Columbia, uh, used that particular model to solve the fishery problem. And the reason I cover fishery problem is twofold. One is because it is a very nice formulation and solution of the problem. And the second one is that Colin Clark went further and wrote another paper later where fishery is a game where you can have more than one fisherman fishing in the same lake. And that problem is the only problem I knew at the time that actually saw a feedback Nash equilibrium game. Usually games are difficult and usually people do open loop and open loop. We'll talk more about that later, but open loop are not the right games to solve. But if that's all you can solve, that's all you can solve. But that one solved as a feedback. And part of that is because of the way the Green's theorem works. And so I covered the game model later on when we do the games. Okay, so this this fishing model will have another life later when we turn this model into a game model. Okay, so that's one. Other model that we turn into game model, the SETI model of advertising, which I did not cover in chapter seven, but I will cover that in stochastic control problem in two two chapters in game and before game. The second problem is optimal forest thinning. And I was working in a, a forest company, a timber company uh, for a summer. And uh, so I was kind of interested in that kind of problem. And I learned uh, uh, this forest thinning model was published by uh, uh, people in Finland. And Finland has a tremendous economy with, which is based on forest. And I happened to visit our Finland uh, and ran into these people. And they were control theory people as well. And they were presenting this model of optimal forest thinning, which I found very interesting. And when they published that paper as well, I when I wrote the book, I figured that, that is a, that's the model I'm going to cover. Because I also developed the forest thinning model when I was at working at White House, a company. But my model was too complicated and not very nice. I published it in some journal, but it was it was it was very elaborate model. Uh, tried to 
put a lot of realism into it. That the way I knew it while working at the forest company, I talked to the forest people to develop that model, but the model became impossible to solve. It was just too complicated, and so I never thought that was a good model to cover anywhere. So I decided not to cover my model, but cover the the, the Finland model. So that's ten point two. The third one is my model as well, exhaustible resource model that I tried to solve, but I'm not going to cover it. So I'm just going to tell you that, 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 that there are a number of exhaustible resource models um, in the literature. Um, I solved a few, and some of them are stochastic, which I also don't cover in this book. But the exhaustible resource model that I cover in this book is partly because I solved the problem of monopoly, I solved the problem of perfect competition, and I solved the problem of maximizing social welfare, all in one model. Different phase of this model um, does this, but it is, I don't cover it because A, there is not enough time, and B, because the, the, the model is somewhat tedious. Okay, it is not elegant. It's a tedious model, it's a nice model, but it's not elegant. I prefer the textbooks should have more elegance and not, not complicated models that are that are best for a journal, not for a book. Okay, so that's sort of what I feel. And so with that story, I think that we are out of time. And we will see you next week when we will do chapter 10. Uh, let me see. Kushali, can you go over with me as to how many classes we have? I think we still have time. It's only 3.33. Class ends at 3.45. Oh, oh. Okay, then I can... Then I can cover a little bit of this material. So let me do that. And then... And also, we... We we we, we, did, we lost some time in the beginning, right? I'm just looking at... We will do 11, and then we have a stochastic control problem, and then we have a differential game problem. So we do have three more chapters uh, after this. So we have four more chapters to go. So yeah, it's a good idea to cover this. So let, let me let me just go on with it. So let's, uh, so I, I tell you the three models. We're now going to cover the first model as much as possible, at least develop it. So Colin Clark. Um, Roy is the discount rate, and I think my Vidal Evolved model was 73, right? So, okay, just a few years later. XT is the biomass of the fish population at time t. So, we have a lake, and there's a, there's a fish, and there's a biomass as to, you know, what is the total size of the fish in this lake. GX is the natural growth function. So the way the natural growth function works is that if there's no fish, there's no growth. And if there are a few fish, then, you know, they make more fish. But if there are too many more fish, then there's not enough to support the population. So we will, we will see how this function is defined by Colin Clark. UT is the rate of fishing effort. Okay, this is this is the rate of effort, and the effort will catch certain fish, and certain fish will create revenue. So once you have an effort, how do you convert that into fish? Fish that you catch is by way of catchability coefficient and by way of biomass of fish. So if I put something in a lake, um, how efficient I am is a catchability and how many fish there are. Depending on those two criteria, I will tell you how many fish I will get, okay? Um, P is the unit price of landed fish. So whatever landed fish means the one that we got out of water. C is the cost of effort. So I make some effort and the effort produces some fish, and 
the fish will create a revenue via price P. And assume that the growth function is differentiable and concave. That means G0 is zero. You can't produce any fish when there's no fish. There are too many fish also. You cannot produce any uh, because there's not enough to support. This is the maximum number of fish that can be supported by the lake. So whatever you produce will die or be eaten by other fish. Gx is bigger than zero. So at every x is bigger than zero for these, these quantities of x between capital zero and capital X. X is called the carrying capacity, which is the maximum sustainable biomass. Now, uh, Colin Clark already had a model. The model were done by people already before him. Uh, it's called the Gordon Schaefer model. The Gordon Schaefer model said that X dot at the rate at which the fish grow is because of the growth function. This is the, the, the Gordon Schaefer model. And then now you can put a control in there. So if you put a control effort U, and if you are as efficient as Q, then you QU is the, the total amount of net effort, if you want to call it. And then the fish biomass is X, so what you catch is a proportional. So QU is then the proportionality, and you catch QU times X amount of fish. Okay, initial fish biomass is zero, X zero. And the profit rate then is, because this is the amount of fish you catch, so the profit rate is P times that landed amount of fish, minus the cost of the effort, which is Cu, which can be written this way. Cu can come out and you can write it this way. And so we have an optimal control problem. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I had a host father in US when I was a student who I would visit their family from time. <laughs> and I still related to them in some way. And they owned a yacht and they will go out sport fishing and I would go on the yacht reading a book um, while we were all day catching fish in Puget Sound in the northwest of uh, Washington. And so I learned a little bit about biomass because they had a sonar, which will tell you where the fish school is, and they will keep going, the yard will keep going until the sonar says there's a lot of fish there. And then they try to catch something. And of course, when there are more fish, there's more catch. And they look at the fish, and they look at the biggest fish because they are sport fishers, so they will throw away all the fish back. And if the biggest fish is not big enough, they will throw everything back. End of the day, they will take one fish, which is the biggest one they caught, okay? And so during the day, you, you have fun, you catch sun, you, there's a little island somewhere, you go to this island and have a lunch go back to the boat, and then eventually come home. And then before you leave this place, you, you your fish is weighed. And uh, if it is only a certain size of fish can be, can be bought, otherwise they will go back in water. And if it is, it is something, it's a fish you can take home, and you can cook it, eat it. So that was basically it. So that was my, some knowledge of my bio fish fishing. I learned a little bit about for biomass and, and catchability. The catchability coefficient has something to do with the gear, the, 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 the sonar, and all, all, the, all that stuff that you can, you, can, you, can, you can. So later on, when we see the government regulation, uh, it is something that I know, I know a little bit about. Okay. Gordon. analyzed the model and found something called the bionomic equilibrium. 
The binomic equilibrium is basically the level at which the total revenue equals the cost. Which means that if you if you if you if you set this guy equal to zero, then you get x b equal to c divided by p q. So that is your binomic equilibrium, and you can keep that equilibrium by that control. That means you can use that amount of fishing, constant amount of fishing, and you will keep the fish at this level. This is called the binomic equilibrium. It is an equilibrium at which the economic rent is completely dissipated. And this is the equilibrium that will be attained if the fishing is left completely open. So if there's open fishing, everybody can go and fish and there are no regulations, no government regulations like the one that I remember uh, going on the yacht. Then eventually the fish will settle at bionomic equilibrium and nobody will make any money anymore. That's it, end of the money making. And so this is the, 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 the concept of bionomic equilibrium that was done by Gordon Schaefer. So what we're now going to do is to develop a control model. And the control model then is that let's take. So this is this is. So take the UB. If you take the UB equal to this P divided by C. And so you put instead of this XB, you put C divided by PQ into inside the G. Then you get UB in terms of the parameter of the problem. So these are the parameters of the problem, and this is your UB, but you want maximum possible fishing effort to be bigger than that. For an optimal control to be defined, UB should be in the interior of zero U. So, Minimum fishing is zero, maximum effort is U, and I would like my control to be U between zero and U. If the fishing effort is U bigger than UB is made, then the total cost exceeds total revenue, so that some fishermen will lose money, and they will drop out, and thus reduce the level of the fishing effort. On the other hand, if fishing effort is less than U, UB, then total revenue exceed total cost, and, and some fishermen will come into fish and increase the fishing effort. And so Gordon Safer mainly basically said that, that this process will lead to binomic equilibrium. Now, they don't solve the control problem. They don't maximize the present value. Okay? And so 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 this is this is what Colin Clark does. And so the cloning card now set up the optimal control problem where you want to maximize the present value of the fish from this lake subject to our constraint, which is the dynamics, 10.2. Uh, Actually, are subject to 10.2, subject to dynamics 10.2, but there's also a constraint. Constraint is, zero u. So where is the equation for constraint? I don't put the equation of constraint. So that problem. So one should say 10.2 and zero u, but anyway, it's understood. Um, slide seven, <clears throat> keep note. If you um, <clears throat> look at my effort of changing the slice even a little bit improvement, you will see how I am a stickler with details. But I think you should also learn something that when you present a paper in a conference, the, the effort that is, goes into the slide should not be small effort. It should be a good amount of effort so that when you present the slides to an audience, that you've done your best job to give the best way 
that you can present this to the, to the people. So you don't want to have a typos, you don't want to have bad formatting, you don't want to have all of these little things, but you also want to have a best way to present it. Um, like, like, let's say, like, in some sense, the presenting of that interpretation of that equation in Kevin Schwartz. So you, you go step by step and do everything. So anyway, just want to tell you something about that. Okay. Um, at this point, I just want to tell you that Colin Clark solved the problem by Green's theorem. And um, we will continue this, but I just want to say that to solve the problem by Green's theorem, you have to convert that into line integrals. So the line integral is given like this. So we have a line integral because this becomes dx. So if you take if you take if you take this, then this side becomes dt, and this side becomes dx. So we have a dt and a dx integral of something dt plus something dx is a line integral in the tx space. And then we have this line integral. And then the line integral, you go Green's theorem. Once you go to Green's theorem, you find this integrand. You set that equal to zero. Um, we'll go back more detail later. Go to zero. And then you have a solution like this, which is like a Vidal Evul problem. If you have too much fish, you fish like hell and then get to this level. If you have too little fish, you don't fish at all for a while until the fishing goes to this one and they go like this. You will see that this X bar is not same as binomial equilibrium. So the most of the thing that we want to learn, because Green theorem is straightforward now, right? We want to learn economically why X bar is not XB. What are the differences between them? We also want to learn what is the characteristic of X bar. And you know X bar will be some sense you can probably define this X bar in some sense as marginal revenue equal to marginal cost in some setting. And you will see that that is the equation that you want to interpret. That is not so easy to see. You see this equation doesn't, doesn't, doesn't say anything if you just look at it the way it is. But it takes effort to, to, to see why this equation is marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. And that requires a slide one and a slide two and a slide three. So at least two slides to, to get there. OK, uh, no, two, no, not two slides, one. So we start from here. We go here, then picture, forget it. Then we go here and then we go here. All the way up to here, we, we find out the marginal value, marginal this thing. And then we also compare X bar and X B. So that's kind of. Uh, also get into the golden rule. And then we get the forest thinning model. So that's that's something that we will do next next week. Um, so that's all for the time being. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, Kuchali will post this right uh, as a recorded lecture.